Hello, I want to go through some tips on if you're taking chemistry class and you're having a hard time, what should you do? Okay. Now, first thing that drives me uh, bonkers as a teacher is if I'm trying to help a student, they have a question, and I ask them a question about their question, they say, I don't know. I don't know anything. You got to tell me. Okay. So here's the thing. You always know something. There is never a chemistry problem, no matter how much you're struggling with, that you don't know anything. And the reason why I say that is because when you're learning chemistry, it is your brain that must change. How much I know in chemistry has no bearing on how successful you will be at chemistry. It's how your brain is going to change. In fact, I could know very little of chemistry and still be an effective teacher if I can get you to think hard and get you to prompt and make the neural connections that you need to do in your brain. So you need to get used to, first more than anything, what is it that I know? What is it that I understand? And even if you feel like that's really far behind or embarrassing, that's okay, because you're gonna to need to get from that point to where we are, okay? So try not to ever say this. If you catch yourself saying this, take a breath and say, wait a minute, I do know something. What is it that I know? When we're talking about being on the struggle bus, there are some bad suggestions to get off of the struggle bus, okay? So for instance, one of the things that's a struggle in chemistry is that it's very abstract. Abstract means you can't sense certain parts of it. Okay, so when we look at symbols like Na and a reaction, that's an abstract idea. I don't, I don't necessarily know, I can't sense that. Now, the opposite of abstract are things that are concrete. So if I actually get a sample of sodium metal, and I get a chunk of it, and here's my sodium metal, then I can take that abstract idea and compare it to something that's concrete. So when I can do that, that's a better neural connection for me than it would be otherwise. So as much as possible, you want to take things that are abstract and pull them into the concrete realm. All right, beyond abstract and concrete, another bad suggestion is outside of class, where you spend 50 minutes to 90 minutes a day in chemistry class dedicated to learning it with an expert is surrounded by peers. There's no better way to learn chemistry than in class. So if you're not learning in class, the solution to that should not go, oh, well, let's do this outside of class. It should be to fix whatever the problem is within the class structure itself. You know, if your teacher's just talking to you the whole hour and you can't pay attention to that, that's the problem. Fix that. If your teacher is, is doing something and it's too fast for you, then you need to prep for class so that it's not too fast for you. But like you want to make good use of that time more so than doing something outside of that time to, to kind of make that better. Um, and then the last thing is the simple things. Look, learning is difficult. Learning chemistry is difficult. And sometimes it looks like it's not difficult for some people, but that's a lie because those people are not always understanding things at the same depth as they should. And maybe they are faster at getting there. Uh, but a lot of times people can do the abstract ideas and they can go, oh, if it's this, then I do this. That's not understanding chemistry though. That's going, wait, this is what this is. And this thing is this other thing, and I can get from here to here by doing this processing. Okay? And that takes time to do. Now, if you were to work out an exercise, you wouldn't try and do the lightest workout possible. You wouldn't want to get like a health expert that could really, they were really strong, so that you could, they could help you lift the weights. Like, you need to do the work. You need your brain to change. Your brain is the one that must change, and therefore your learning must be difficult. So, when we look at things that aren't productive, the first five or so on this list are all simple. Reading the textbook, highlighting, taking notes, rereading notes, and watching YouTube videos. Those are all limited engagement from you. And that means that your brain is less likely to change dramatically. And that's a problem, right? In fact, I'm gonna to link to a YouTube video on learning science through YouTube videos. And I, I understand the irony here, that here we are on YouTube. But watching a YouTube video, um, it just, you evaluate whether or not the person sounds like they make sense. And the problem with that is that when you're evaluating whether or not they sound like they're making sense, you're not taking what's in your brain and looking at that. So if I tell you, I give you a perfect explanation of chemistry, that doesn't mean that you're going to learn it because your brain has different ideas that's starting from than mine does. The comment we hear from students all the time is, I understand it when you do it, but when I go to do it, I'm lost. And that, that's not gonna get help in watching YouTube videos, although this will actually show what you can do to improve that. Now, tutoring. Uh, tutoring is something that can have benefits, but often people over rely on it. So when we tutor, a lot of times a tutor will come in and explain things to you again, just like the teacher did. And again, they're starting with what they know. So when you have a new person who has things they know, 
But again, it has to start with you. So if you want to have a tutor be effective, you need to go to them and say, here's what I understand, here's what I don't understand, and share with them what's in your brain, and then allow them to give feedback based on what you, you know. And the same thing with the teacher. If your teacher just explains to you the same thing again and again and again, it's not going to address what's in your brain. It's far better for you to go up to a teacher and say, here's my question about this. I don't understand when this says grams of this, why there's grams instead of this thing. Because that way you're sharing with them what you have in your head and, you can, and they can respond to that and give you feedback for that. One last note on these first four things. The simpler learning stuff, reading and rereading, uh, changes little in your brain. And because of that, it builds your confidence. So if I reread my textbook three times, I'm going to feel really smart until I go into the test. When I get to the test, I'm going to be overconfident and I'm going to do poorly. Hard learning breaks down your confidence. And so if you're doing learning and it feels like it's not working, that's because you've been taught to kind of be counterproductive with what, what you, when you learn the most, you feel the least confident. Now, some things that can help you that are more productive than those that we usually do. So first thing is write down everything you know. And you want to do that with just a blank sheet of paper where you're retrieving information from your brain. Okay? It's called a brain dump. Uh, try doing problems. Now, the key in those two is that you're, you're taking information from your brain and retrieving it, and the, the part of bringing information out of your brain actually enhances your learning. And it's called a retrieval practice that you can see down here. Uh, but the number one thing you can do as a student is quiz yourself frequently, answer questions without listening to someone else. And a lot of times when you're struggling, that's intimidating to kind of go, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, but you got to do it in order to get better. Okay? Uh, making predictions in class, if you're going to do an experiment, write down what you think is going to happen first. Even if you're wrong, it will set up the neural pathway to form when you see what the right answer is. And you'll be more surprised by the discrepancy, which will make it more memorable. So even if you make wrong predictions, you'll learn more. If you get really, really stuck and you're just a hot mess, focus on one thing. I'm going to learn how to change grams of a chemical into moles of a chemical and nothing else. And I'm not going to move on until I get it. And just do that thing over and over again. Talk to your teacher and say, look, i gotta, I got to get one thing down for the next two days is all I'm doing. And I want to make sure that I can do it. And once you do that and you get that one success, you can build from there. And you can move on to the next thing and go, all right, I know something in chemistry that, that's important and I can use that to learn the next thing. Uh, but if you just try and do everything all at once all the time, you're just going to be overwhelmed and it's going to be inefficient. Elaborative interrogation is like an annoying four-year-old that keeps asking you why, where you do it to yourself. So why, why is this a two here? Why is this the same as this, but this part is different? Why did I choose to do this? Why, and you keep looking for the why until you get to things that you don't know. And you're trying to uncover what do you know, what do you not know, and you're trying to find links between those two. What evidence do I have that can help me figure out the part I don't know? Particle representations are really big. These are something that takes a abstract thing like a formula and allows you to make a concrete representation of it that you can see uh, and that you can kind of picture changing. So if I have multiple sodium chlorides, what does that look like? You know, does this go here? Does it go here? Uh, if I heat that up, what happens to it? What if I have billions of them? You know. So you can start to piece together different questions and have a visual representation that's more that your brain is better designed for. This makes more sense to your brain than this does. Um, so you want to utilize, utilize that and draw particle representations whenever you're trying to work on stuff. Okay. Timing plays a big role. The best time to start trying harder is at a new unit. So it'll be more successful if you try harder at the start of unit three than at the middle of unit two. Uh, if you try and you say, you know what, I'm gonna really put in a lot more effort, you gotta be patient. You might, in week three, so you know what, this has not gone as well as I'd hoped. I'm going to put in more effort. And on the fifth week, you might take a test, and your grade is still just as bad. It takes time sometimes to get better at chemistry. Sometimes it takes more than a year. So, but that will eventually pay off. And you might not even notice it because, you know, if you had just shut down in week three, then you got into week five, you might have done even worse. But that, that eventually pays off. The more you learn, the better you're going to get. And so you just got to keep with it and be patient that, you know, you might have to wait a little while before you see the results of that hard work. And the biggest thing in here is spacing. So if we have two students and on Tuesday, one student studies for 30 minutes, on Wednesday, that student studies for 30 minutes, and Thursday, they study for 30 minutes. And the second student studies for an hour and a half on Thursday alone. When they take the test on Friday, these two students are gonna do similarly. 
but this student has learned more. And the reason for that is because when you learn, as soon as you stop, you start to forget. In, in order to, for things to stay in your memory better, you have to forget and then relearn. If I learn a set of students' names, and then I learn a new set the next year, and I see one of those students from the year before, and I forgot their name, and I go, oh no, I forgot their name, and I look it up in my, in my paper, and I remember, oh, it's this name. I'll remember that name better because I've forgotten it and then relearned it. And that locks it into your neural structure better. So even though these two students come out of test one, pretty comparable, this student is gonna do better in unit two, and do better in unit three, and better in unit four. This is called space practice. Um, when we looked at doing flashcards, so flashcards you can you can kind of make anything on a flashcard. Doesn't has don't just do vocabulary terms. You can do practice problems. You can do pictures, particle diagrams. Uh, but if you do these, and then when it's not that unit, you bring it back out and do it again. You're like, oh, what was polar bonds about? What is it? Why is the electronegativity value relevant here? Uh, doing that in a spaced interval will actually enhance all the things that you learn. All right, so we get a new problem. Uh, this should be a subscript, of course. So how many grams of this are needed to make a 200 milliliter 0.2 molar solution? So when you get something like this, I know your teachers are gonna guide you into looking at the numbers and units. But really you wanna look at anything that looks chemistry related. So solutions, grams, how many, um, in terms of how much, all of those factors matter. Uh, when we go through and look at problems, you want to steer clear of equations. You want to steer clear of dimensional analysis. Those things are very algorithmic, very abstract, and therefore you don't have to learn chemistry in order to be able to do them. So instead of them, here's some other tools you can use. One is slope. So when I take 0 0.20 molar, which is 0 0.20 moles of magnesium sulfate per one liter of solution, solution, I can make that into a slope where I take 0.2 moles and one liter and I say okay I'm gonna make a slope like that and I can do some analysis from that line to say you know okay well if I'm here higher up on this line and that means I have more than one liter and that would mean that I have more than 0.2 moles and so we can start to do some proportional reasoning from this and proportional reasoning is far, uh, far better for you to be able to actually go through and go, what do I know, what do I not know, and why? Because you're doing comparisons. So a couple tools for that. So one is we can take this slope or this set of units here and write a for every statement. Or for every statement for this would be for every one liter of solution, there are 0.2 moles of magnesium sulfate. And we can use that to set up proportional reasoning where we say, okay, well, if I have 0.2 moles for every one liter, then how many moles would I have if I had 200 milliliters, which is 0.2 liters? So here I can say, okay, well, this is five times less. So this must also be five times less if these are the same proportion. So you'd still come up with that slope of 0.2. So now I know that this is going to be 0.04 uh, zero moles of magnesium sulfate, and now I can actually get through and solve the question pretty easily because I just need to change that into grams. Note that when I do that, that the word per means per one. And if you add that number in, it's really helpful. If I say moles per liter or grams per mole or miles per hour, it's miles per one hour, grams per one mole. And that number one can actually add a lot of clarity for novice students who are just doing chemistry for the first time. And then at the end, you should be able to tie this in. What would that look like? If I went in the lab, what would a 0.2 molar solution? It would be a beaker. I'd have some water in it, and I'd have 0.2 moles, however many grams that is, of magnesium sulfate that would dissolve into that solution. Okay? Now, go ahead and give this a whirl. If you were to read this question, and let's say you're partially through chemistry and you're here because you're struggling, what do you know from that? Even if you're not to this question in, in your chemistry thing, what things do you recognize? When I say how many grams, does that connect with you? Maybe you don't know what the relevance of, of the NA is, but do you know what it stands for? Do you know what it represents? Do you know what state of matter it is? Do you know other features about it? Um, 20 grams of sodium oxide, do you know what decompose means? Do you have an idea of what it might mean if you don't? And you wanna get used to going through and doing this analysis of like, what do I know, what do I not know, and can I link the two to find a solution? 
Last thing is that there are fundamental ideas in chemistry and you want to be familiar with them and a lot of them are things like positive and negative charges attract, like charges repel, solids, liquids, and gases differ in their spacing and their motions uh, to some degree. Really, solids can move just as fast. Um, so solids, liquids, and gases differ. And then for chemical reactions, we're looking at charged particles are moving, what's going on in a chemical reaction. Collisions plays a critical role throughout chemistry uh, and how things happen. So students want to have a list of kind of fundamental ideas accumulating as they go through chemistry so that when you get stuck in a problem, you can go, okay, I'm stuck. What, what fundamental idea do I know, though, that this could relate to? Okay, I don't know what Na is, but I know it's a solid. I know what that might look like at the particle level. I'm going to draw a picture of it. You know, I don't know what this thing is, but I know it's a compound. Uh, it's got charged particles. They're sticking together some way, somehow. And so from this, you can start to put together some of the questions and ideas that will help you learn. Now, if we kind of summarize here, some of the big things were you want to do difficult, challenging work in order to learn better. And when you're struggling, it's really easy to kind of try and rely on someone who's smarter than you. Don't. You need to change your brain. You need to look at what's in your brain and reflect and revise to learn. It doesn't matter if you go find someone else to explain it to you. You need to look at what you know and what you think. And for whatever reason, we tend to be embarrassed by that because we, we feel like we can't say things that are wrong. And it's not wrong, it's what's in your head. But it could be better by you talking about it and looking at what you said and then thinking about, does that make sense? Does it connect to the experimental evidence we've seen? Does it connect to what the teacher has proposed? And then from that, improve on that to get to a point where this looks a little bit easier to you and you're a little more successful at kind of figuring stuff out. Uh, and so you wanna go through that progression again and again, and you wanna use tools that are gonna help you work harder in your brain uh, and not just build up false confidence.